Hi, everybody, and welcome. This is Dave Optin speaking, and wherever you're joining us from, both Don and I are delighted that you've taken some time from your day to join us for today's call. And we're, we're going to uh, kind of get into your, your questions here in, in very short order. But I just wanted to take a moment at the beginning here, particularly for those of you who are new to, uh, to these calls, to just kind of uh, review the bidding on, on the format and, and how things work. Because I know in this day and age, uh, most of the time, if something is coming online, everybody assumes it's a presentation of some sort with lots of fly, slides and so forth and so on. Uh, and we certainly have plenty of those. Uh, but this is not the format for uh, for today's uh, uh, program. This is essentially kind of a, a, a Q&A uh, where Don and I are simply here as resources for, for those of you on the call to try to uh, share with you whatever our experiences or suggestions or ideas might be around issues that you would like our, uh, our thoughts on. And so in that sense, you set the agenda here today. Um, the way you do that, uh, is pretty straightforward. If you look over there on the right at the uh, GoToMeeting sort of dashboard there, if you will, there's a place to post uh, uh, questions or and, and just type them in. It works pretty much like instant messaging. We'll be able to see that. Uh, and we will get to as many of the uh, points that you, uh, that you want us to talk about as we can in the hour that we, uh, that we have together. So uh, don't be reticent at all. Uh, it's open season on anything you want to talk about, and we'll do our very best to share with you uh, our, our thoughts on, on whatever that subject, uh, whatever that subject might be. So please feel free to do that. We don't use any names or anything like that. So if confidentiality is an issue, uh, please don't concern yourselves with that as well. And for those of you who uh, might not have had an opportunity to catch Don on one of the many webinars that he uh, that he does with Execunet or as a guest on one of these calls, and he's been that frequently as well. Uh, let me just give you a, a, a quick overview on his, uh, on his background so you know the, how fortunate we are to have his level of expertise with us today. Um, before joining uh, ExecuNet, Don had founded and spent more than 17 years as the CEO of Rainmaker Associates, which was a performance improvement consulting, coaching training, and executive search firm uh, headquartered in New Hampshire, which is uh, where he still lives. Uh, he is a recognized expert in personal branding and marketing, networking, interviewing. Uh, he has a very wide range of experience. And the fact that he's had experience not only on the, on the coaching side, but also on the search side, makes him especially valuable to, uh, to the calls that, he, that he's available to, to share with us. He's a graduate of SUNY Albany uh, with a BS degree in business. He holds a master's in counseling and has an advanced management certification from Hofstra. Uh, and I could go on uh, with a lot of other things, but we want to get to the questions. Uh, but that should certainly give you a sufficient idea in terms of, uh, of, the, of the expertise that, uh, that we have with you to today. So Don, welcome. Thanks uh, for joining me again. My pleasure, Dave. Nice to be here. OK. All right, so let's, uh, let me start with this one, Don. Uh, this is a, a member who, who says, I'm 62. I'm searching for a full-time position. How real is age discrimination? That's a question it, that comes up with a yeah, fair amount of sure frequency, as, as you know. And uh, why don't you share some of your thoughts on that for folks who are, uh, uh, who in, are in that age group, if you will? <laughs> 62 and depressed. There you yes. go. Um, so age discrimination is real. For some jobs, it makes sense. Um, I'm not sure I'd want an 80-year-old firefighter trying to make it up the ladder to carry me on their shoulder. Um, but truth be known, my experience is that the greatest obstacle for someone who's 62 and looking for a full-time job <clears throat> uh, takes place between their ears. I think there's a perception out there that um, it's going to be near impossible at age 62 to find a job. I'm here to tell you that <laughs> that's not true. <clears throat> Excuse me, there are some places, especially large companies, that might be hesitant. It may very well be dependent on the job itself. But uh, I would strongly recommend that 
you not think about how old you are, but how experienced you are and how much you could bring to a new role, especially in a smaller company where that experience, that background, that maturity um, might be highly um, appreciated by those who are there and in that company. So to me, um, yes, there are folks who are going to discriminate against you, but you know what? They'll disc if, if it's not that, it might be because you jumped around too much. It might be because you stayed too long in a particular job. It might be because your name sounds foreign to them, literally and figuratively. There are always going to be folks who are going to eliminate candidates for one reason or another, age being one of those. But don't let it get you down. You may not be dealing with 100% of the market, but there's a significant portion of the market that will hire you assuming that you're experienced and have been successful and you can bring some value to this role. And let me just piggyback on that for a second. One of the biggest issues that we have with uh, executives that we get to talk with is that they really can't define their unique value, don't know how to do that. Um, it's not easy to do it for oneself. It becomes particularly important when somebody is of a certain age that they know the unique value they can bring, and that unique value is articulated in your collateral. And if someone were to ask you that question early on in the conversation, so there are lots of elements here. There's no simple answer. Yes, there is age discrimination, but not as much as one might normally think. Um, might have been more a year or two or three ago than today, but right now the market is such that folks are looking for qualified candidates. And if you happen to be 62, um, I, I think it'll be overlooked in many cases. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Let me just add a couple of quick things because, as I mentioned at the outset, this is something that comes up with uh, great frequency, particularly considering since the average age in ex of executive members is 53. Um, I've often told members this, that when it comes to things like discrimination, uh, whether it's on age or any other subject on a very long list that I'm, a, I'm happily most of us could, could go through, I've always felt, and, and I guess to some degree in life has experienced, that it's kind of a spectrum. Uh, on one end of the spectrum are people whose minds you are never going to change, irrespective right. of what their bias might be. On the other end of that spectrum are minds that you don't have to worry about changing because they're focused on, on solutions of one variety or, or another, and they're looking for competencies and, and skill sets. I think the rest of the world, and I think that includes most of us, fall somewhere in the middle of that. In other words, do we have biases? Probably. Um, but we're willing to listen. We are influenceable. And, and that is where I will usually encourage people to, to invest, their, uh, invest their time and energy. For members here, and, and the other quick thing I would say is, from a job search point of view, uh, and, and this is just my opinion, and, and I guess sort of a collection of, of kind of what I viewed over the marketplace the last 40 plus years I've been running around it, um, is that when it comes to age discrimination, um, I would tend to focus my energies more on smaller companies than larger ones um, for a whole host of reasons, but primarily because uh, they are often looking for, uh, for more mature expertise to help them uh, in their growth, growth path. And obviously, there is no substitute for experience. So I would tend to focus on, on those uh, you know, going forward and, uh, and kind of take it from there. One last thing. Um, if you're a Platinum member with us, uh, you already know that we have a myriad of, of, of webinars that address a wide variety of topics, including age discrimination. And if you're interested in, in really getting focused on it for, for, uh, in terms of really specific ideas and things like that, next time you log in, if you go up to the top of the screen, um, uh, right after the, the, the little icon that welcomes you, and, um, uh, and you go there, uh, and you go into um, uh, managing, your, uh, managing the career aspect of your search, you'll see a little uh, 
a little um, uh, magnifying glass up at the top of the page, uh, sort of the universal symbol for search, if you will. You click it, type in age discrimination, it will bring up a number of content articles and programs around that subject, uh, one of which is, um, um, uh, I forget forgotten the precise title, but it's something like Making a Move at 50 Plus. It's done by Gene Erickson Walker, who has run our meetings out in the Portland area for a number of years. And if you haven't had a chance to check out that program, uh, I would urge you to do so as well. Uh, hey, let okay. Me, let yeah. me just add one thing quickly. Yeah, please. Most cities um, have a list that they publish once a year um, in, in, in newspapers, if yeah. anyone on the call remembers what those are, um, of the best companies to work for. You mm -hmm. know, Fortune usually does this. Um, there are ones that are specific to women and families, but my experience is that any company that's on that list is going to be less likely to discriminate yeah. than companies that aren't on the list. So it's another place to potentially look. Good, good point. Thanks, Don. Um, Question says, uh, in addition to job searching, I need to make some, some, <laughs> some money and have started up my own consultancy. So far, this has not been a barnstormer. Business has been slow, so I'm thinking about other part-time work as well. This, of course, dilutes my job search efforts. How realistic is it for me to expect to find a new full-time position, and this person happens to be age 62, uh, while I also spend time uh, doing part-time work, be it consulting or otherwise? Uh, Don, I'm sure that you've talk to clients who face this uh, the same kind of issue it's kind of difficult thing to decide how do I how do I slice up my day in terms of my efforts your thoughts well I, I, I think that the member who asked the question probably already knows the answer in that in the ideal uh, searching for a job is a full-time job itself so when you're either employed and or have a consulting practice or other part-time gigs, it means that you have that much less time to um, that much less time to to search. And so, in a case like that, my recommendation is that you focus your limited time in the areas that are most likely to provide you with the greatest return. So. I'm going to start with the obvious one that most people do, where the return is almost nil, and that is applying to jobs online, whether it's on our site or any site. Mm -hmm. You know, the likelihood of your next role coming from that is rather small. Right. Whereas, if you were spending your limited time networking and getting introductions, to meet with other senior executives and or in companies that have jobs available and don't go in cold by simply responding to them, but trying to get an introduction in so that you're in running the process and getting to the decision maker, to me that's a far better use of one's limited time. So yeah. if you have a scorecard and you're keeping score of how well you're doing, then I would suggest that the scorecard should include uh, connections with recruiters, um, networking meetings, either going to executive meetings that are held around the country or other networking meetings that are held in your local community. Um, and trying to get introductions. I would much rather you track the number of introductions you can get rather than the number of blind resumes that you've sent out. Yeah. So, yes, you can find a job while still doing other stuff, but use, uh, optimize your time as much as possible. Otherwise, it's going to be a very, very, very long process. Yeah, well said, Don. Thanks. Um, this person wants to know, uh, there are major changes going on within my organization and at the branch that I manage. We, pur we purchased a private company, and they're going to uh, call our branch was it say here, are going to call our branch, that company, and use their technology, et cetera, et cetera. They will be replacing me, I'm the general manager, with an area general manager uh, from the acquiring company. 
I will get a standard severance, but I've been asked to stay on for an additional 30000 until the 30th of November. So I would end up with a total severance of, say, around 120000 I currently make a salary of 150 uh, plus bonus. I'm really stressing about not having a job and feel the peace of mind might be worth more than the money. Uh, my husband has his own business, so I can carry the health, the insurance uh, with all of the benefits. One recruiter thinks I would be crazy to walk away from that package. What do you guys think? Uh, my my initial instinct is you'd be crazy to walk away from that package um, for a couple of reasons. There, one of the discriminations we didn't talk about at the beginning of this call is discrimination against people who are unemployed. Yep. And there was a major study done by Northeastern University not that long ago that showed that after six months of unemployment, um, there are many who skim resumes for a living mm -hmm. who will summarily um, eliminate you from the running simply because you've been unemployed too long. Mm -hmm. So I always recommend that the longer you can stay employed or show that you're employed, the better off you are. <clears throat> so to me, that's the major reason. Number two, I think that one, um, if one has the, the advantage of looking for a job while employed, that there are ways of doing that. Um, for example, we have a concierge service that helps um, it helps members uh, who are employed, um, who don't have full time to go out and look for a job, not to get a job, but to get introductions. It's an introduction service. Um, it's a three month commitment. Um, it, it starts at over $9,000. So I know for many of you that may not be possible, but if I was earning, $120,000 between now and the end of the year, I might invest some of that in a service where you can outsource um, this to a, an expert on my team who can help you to get introductions so that if you need to take a day off to go for, for an interview, um, it's already qualified. Um, and uh, you can sort of target the opportunities or have us target them for you based on ge geography, the role, the level, the salary. Um, you know, we do that for members um, and we could do that for you and it would be a good way of using this um, money that they're willing to pay you uh, to expedite your getting a new job and if you have to tell a new employer that you wouldn't be available till December 1st, that's not the worst thing either. So just some thoughts on that. Yeah, I would, I would certainly agree with it, uh, and particularly as it relates to, uh, you know, to the discrimination factor. The, you know, uh, so I would, I would probably uh, say stay and, um, and, and use that time. And by the way, um, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with looking for your next gig from there. The fact that they've made you that offer in the first place, they know perfectly well um, that, that you uh, have every right to and will be using some of that time uh, to look for your next assignment. So um, that would be another and reason. And that could almost be, rather than, make, rather than hope that they would understand that, you might ask them, yep. since I need to be looking for my next job, is sure. it okay with you if you know, well, from time to time, I go on an interview. So I would build that into this transition package so that everything was being done above board. Yep, I think so too. This question, this person says, I just started a new job and when I arrived, uh, found out that my boss, vice president, was out on an extended leave. I have offered to step up uh, to lead in this area uh, on an interim basis since I have, the, have that experience, but I'm not sure where it's headed. Do either of you have any advice on how to approach this smartly for my benefit or if I should choose to leave sooner rather than later and how to explain this to someone during an interview? Not quite sure I understand the end of the, uh, of the right. question. I think, I think the thrust of it is, um, uh, I think what he's saying is he might, he might be asked to leave if he stepped up now and the person came back. 
Um, no, I didn't. I didn't hear it that way, Dave. I heard well, it. I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting it. I'm, I'm thinking right. that's what it is. But uh, okay. I think there's also a built-in question here about what is the risk to me since I'm new here, right? Uh, uh, to step into a role who somebody who would probably be my boss when I came back and uh, might be not too happy that I did that, etc. And so from a uh, you know, a, a role assumption point of view, what what might be the the smart strategy for me to follow? Well, if I was concerned about my boss, I would speak to that person and get his or her advice uh, before doing anything. Um, it, it needs to be positioned correctly so that it doesn't appear as if you're simply um, you know, flying over this opportunity, hovering, and now that it's happening, you know, swooping in, um, you uh, if, if you had been on the job a little longer, hopefully your performance would have shown them that you were more than qualified to assume this more senior level role, and they may have approached you. So, if I was going to, um, if I was going to throw my hat in the ring, I would do so making clear that the understanding is I'm trying to be a good, a good soldier here. Um, and I'm just trying to fill this void until my boss comes back, understanding that, you know, I would then go back into my other role. Maybe I can do both roles simultaneously. Um, but I would try to speak to um, this person on extended leave if that was if that was doable, to make sure that they were comfortable and maybe they could give me some advice, knowing more about the politics of the organization as to how to articulate this, to go forward with this, or to just leave it be because, you know, it, it's not worth the effort. Fair enough. And okay. then if, he, if you end up leaving because your boss doesn't come back and it becomes untenable for you, then I think you simply tell the truth. You were hired, you went to work at this company because you were impressed with uh, Mary Smith, Mary went off on sick leave. Um, it removed a major reason for joining the company. Rather than stay in the chaos that was created, I chose to just leave and move on. Um, to me, most employers would understand that. Yep. Uh, let me just uh, pause here for just, just a moment, uh, Don because I want to uh, make sure that, that we uh, tell the callers or that something about which, uh, particularly if, they, if they're new, uh, and that's this. Uh, when you, we have a lot of people, when they come in to, uh, to join, whether, whether as basic members or as platinum members, uh, um, their perception coming through the door is that, well, this is just a job board like everything else, and so they run off to the, set up a job alert and don't do anything else, which is not a great idea at all. We post jobs here, that's true, but the jobs that are posted here are only the very, very tip of the iceberg, particularly because of the levels at which we operate. I would say, uh, I mean, we have data that would tell you that the 92 or 93 percent of jobs where the compensation is at 200K and up never see the light of day. And you've already heard Don and, and myself both talk about the, the, the component that networking plays in terms of making a job change. 70% uh, of our members tell us uh, over the years that, that that was the major component leading to their, uh, to their making a change. So uh, one of the ways that you do that um, is to make sure that you've got your profile here set up and set up properly because uh, a lot of people, uh, they just forget about that. So what I would certainly suggest that you do is uh, when you log in, you can see I've uh, and I logged into my account two areas that you need to address, and this is true whether you're a new, er a new member or you haven't uh, done it in a while. Make sure that that profile presents you the way you should be, and that includes a picture, and that you've got a resume posted here. And, and one of both of those things are extremely important uh, because your, your profile here is the first place that the recruiters are going to come. It's the first place that other members will come. So if you haven't done that recently, um, I would certainly urge you to uh, uh, to do so. I'm sorry for the diversion, but I didn't want to uh, overlook that because it's it's important. A lot of people sometimes they miss it. Um, Don, here's a question, uh, and it's 
kind of good news for this person. I'm glad to see it. it says, I'm two weeks into my search, and I've got two rounds of second interviews and companies uh, talking dollars. Uh, is the market really this hot? My concern is maybe I should be shooting a bit higher, title-wise or dollar-wise, uh, than maybe I was thinking. Uh, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area tech industry, but senior directors and directors of sales ops and not engineering might be, a, might be an option. Are companies promoting uh, in this market? And uh, therefore, should I maybe even try to leverage it into a VP title? I would just quickly say, without more information, it's kind of, kind of tough to say, but uh, the job market is no different in that sense than any other market in the economy, and that is it, it, it functions on supply and demand. And there are sections of this market where the demand is extremely high, and therefore you can leverage a lot of things. And if that's the segment you're in, that could very well explain why you've gotten uh, so far so quickly. Uh, and the other side of it might be true, uh, you know, might be true as well. Uh, but without without more information, it would be kind of hard to, uh, I think, to supply a you know real counsel uh, at this stage of the game. Don, any thoughts on that? You know, I I joined Executive about five and a half years ago really at the height of the recession when nobody was getting interviews. And so I've watched it change over that five and a half years to the point now where um, what this member was describing is not atypical. That is people getting interviews um, and getting them more quickly than perhaps they ever envisioned they were. So I think that's um, that tends to be uh, an overall or broader based uh, market observation. It's become far more a buyer's market than it was a number of years ago, and that's great news for all of our members. Um, whether or not you can then use that and parlay that to get a job that's a level up with more money uh, or not, um, maybe the jobs you're negotiating for right now uh, if you know how to negotiate the deal, um, you could ask for uh, a more senior title and or money commensurate with that. So I wouldn't necessarily uh, stop following through on this second round of, of interviews, but I might begin thinking about what is it that I'm really going to ask for and if I can't get the title that I'm looking for today, maybe they'll give me a promise about within a year, or maybe they'll give me the compensation commensurate with that title where I'm currently working. So there are lots of ways of negotiating this, lots of ways of playing this. It's nice that you've got options. Options and offers are what we're hoping all of our members get. For sure. Um, this member wants to know and says, I'm limiting my search to a relatively small metro area. What search tips do you have uh, when there is a self-imposed limitation such as this? <laughs> I, my first recommendation would be rethink your strategy. Mm -hmm. So um, I get that there are folks who can't move. You've got kids in school. Um, you've got elderly parents in that neighbor in that neighborhood. Um, you can't um, you can't leave where you are. I get that, um, but you get apparently the fact that by limiting geography, you're also limiting the number of job opportunities, the number of companies that might be interested in you. So this is uh, a conundrum of sorts, <clears throat> and um, assuming that a move out of that community for whatever good reason, is not possible. What it really means to me is that you need to have a job search strategy and plan that identifies potential employers, um, be able to sort through them and decide which ones are companies that might be of interest to you, to find out which ones of those might be hiring to try to get the other ones to potentially create a job for you that might not currently be on the drawing board. Because when you're limited, you really need to network even more effectively. You need to be able to open doors 
in that limited number of companies, and you can't do that as effectively if you simply cross your fingers and hope one of them posts a job at some point. You really need to be proactive on your own behalf and in many cases create a job for yourself. Yeah, I just want to add one thing quickly to that uh, because again this is something that comes up very very frequently uh, for, for all the reasons that, Don, uh, that Don's mentioned as to why most of us uh, you know, are interested in kind of staying put. Uh, and it's this, uh, and this is true of, of particularly when uh, when you're when you're sort of scanning the uh, the marketplace for stuff. Uh, I would not want to. What you, I, what I, my counsel is, I would look for opportunities, whether it's through networking or or the time that you spend online. I would look for opportunities where the job content that you see, if it was located in your local community, you would be kind of frothing at the mouth, if you will. Don't worry about where it says the job is at that point in time, you know, particularly if you're, you're responding to postings or things like that. Uh, nobody's asked you to move anywhere yet. All kinds of things happen once a conversation begins, particularly true in this day and age through the wonders of modern telecommunications. Uh, I can't tell you how frequently I've seen things happen where a person who was restricted uh, for whatever reasons, um, uh, uh, found a, uh, uh, got interviews with, with a company that originally when they were looking for it were expecting someone to relocate to City X, whatever it was. But once the conversation got going, they said, you know what, we understand the situation. Here's, and they worked out a thing where uh, the person could be there for a while on an orientation basis and then come home. There was a fair amount of travel involved in the job, said you can do it from here. Uh, so that's what I mean about things changing. So. Um, if you've got that kind of a constraint, I would start broadly and work your way back from uh, work your way back from there. Good point. Okay. Um, question: What can Execunet do for me in order to flesh out or define my unique uh, value proposition? Um, uh, is that is that something that's part of the uh, uh, the resume review. I think that this person maybe uh, have, has linked. They saw uh, the link uh, on the page under under managing the resumes to schedule a review. Uh, you're entitled to a resume review. Uh, if you haven't had one, you can sign up at the link that I showed you on the uh, on the slide when you go into my account, um, and and uh, somebody will certainly uh, review that with you. Um, but look, and and. Uh, Don, you want to talk a little bit yeah, about, sure. about the value proposition? Because I know you've done Absolutely. some terrific programs on that subject as well. Well, you know, I indicated earlier that both in the networking meeting that I run in the Boston area, and mm -hmm. if there's anyone on the call from the Boston area, know that a week from Friday, a week from today, next Friday, yep. I'll, be, I'll be doing um, the monthly networking meeting in Waltham. And if you need more information, anyone that might answer the phone at Executinet would be able to help you to sign up. And, um, as a matter of fact, an invitation is going out, a second one on Sunday, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, so in those meetings, I ask people what their unique value is. These are all senior level folks. These are all folks who should be able to answer that question, and a very, very small percentage can, at least can in a way that's differentiating. So one of the coaching modules, and Executinet offers uh, about a dozen different coaching modules to members. They're for fee, just so that there's no misunderstanding. Um, one of them is called the You in Value. And um, one of our coaches can truly help you to sort out what your unique value proposition is. And then there's another module called Your Value Conversation, where you get to practice uh, with us on sharing um, this value message, if you would, both in an interview setting and in a networking setting, one a little bit longer in content than the other. But these are, as I said, two of about a dozen coaching modules that we provide to you. Um, so that if you need help uh, with your value proposition, we can 
we can support you in that regard and we can do the same around how to find and engage recruiters, how to um, network, how to interview, how to negotiate your deal, how to onboard into your next role. I mean, a whole array of coaching modules that have all been developed at the request of members over the last four or five years. And um, we think is very, very helpful, especially to folks who haven't been out there, haven't done a search in a long time, and are now struggling. No need to struggle. We can help you. Thanks, Don. Uh, this, this came in from a member, and, and uh, I would preface it by saying, once, once you hear it, that he should understand that he's definitely not alone here. <laughs> uh, he says, I'm 56 years old. I've been oh, a kid. Senior... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, and have been a senior manager, a senior marketing manager with a technology firm for more than 16 years. I'm now in transition and struggling to find a recruiter uh, to work with uh, under the old model of meeting me and then presenting me to a variety of companies. It seems today that recruiters rely heavily on online searches, specific word matches, and fitting a position to candidates uh, that score, score well on key term searches and things like that. How does someone recruit a recruiter in today's online recruiting model? Um, John, your thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts are, you know, I'm sitting here smiling because yeah. this 56-year-old senior marketing technology manager probably uses e-marketing to attract customers. Um, and so the technology has changed, my guess, for you in terms of how you market for your company the same way it has for recruiters. Now, as somebody that ran a recruiting company for 15 years, I'm here to tell you that I'm not a big fan of how recruiters now treat potential candidates. Here's the but understatement I, of the week. I, I, I do understand it. Uh, one of the sessions that we run probably three times a year uh, in the networking meeting in the Boston area is with a panel of recruiters. And so I'll tell you what they tell us, which is, number one, um, they don't have the time, the energy, or the inclination to simply look at uh, your collateral um, and to um, and to send you uh, meet you for lunch, uh, send you a note back, all of the things that we used to do five, ten, fifteen years ago. Uh, most of those are no longer operative. So the same thing that I recommended before is even more important here, which is if you want to get in front of a recruiter, find somebody you know who knows that recruiter and get an introduction. That's the secret. That's the secret to getting in that door. If Somebody was to come to me and I was still a recruiter and said, hey, Dave Optin suggested that uh, I give you a call. Um, would you be willing to speak to me next week? I would, of course, say yes. If that same person sent me an unsolicited resume um, and then tried to get a meeting with me, I'd probably have no time for them. So the best way to get in the door with those recruiters is through an introduction. Otherwise, the reality that you just described um, is spot on, and it's not going away anytime soon. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I would. Re there's really a lot to uh, really a lot to add to that. Although I, I guess in in this context, and that is, it's very very important uh, um, to remember that recruiters. Um, you know, get paid by, by, by clients to find specific uh, folks to, to fill specific jobs. Um, they are, and, and so they will often, and, and, and rightly so in a way, not that I, I like the behavior of, of not responding, but, uh, you know, their, their life revolves around making telephone calls, not taking them. And they are focused on specific things. So um, the fact that that, that that feels like a, a dead-end street in, in many cases 
uh, you know, that's kind of the reason that, it, that it's that way. And so Don is, is absolutely correct. And think of it to yourself in terms of people who've networked with you or who, who wanted to, to get in to see you. You probably would make time for those who come where, where the request comes via, uh, you know, from a friend of yours who said, hey, Joe is a pretty good guy, and, and if you could take a few minutes to talk with him, I would appreciate it. Uh, that you would probably do unsolicited call. You probably you probably wouldn't. Uh, this is why well, we most of us back don't in, take calls at dinner time. Well, that's true. from folks who are looking to quote unquote sell us something, yeah. and candidates are looking to sell themselves to a recruiter, and one's reaction to that is probably the same as my reaction when I yell at people at dinner time for disturbing me. So um, it's a rational kind of response. I don't like it. I, I don't support it. If I ever went back into recruiting, I would try to distinguish my brand by being nice. Yeah. Yeah. All us guys named Donald do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> this, this person says, uh, wants to know, uh, uh, Don, what, how long do you consider too much or too little time uh, in, a, in a job. I think they're talking more about, you know, sort of the previous perception of job hopping or not. And yes. What, what looks, where, where's that line? I, I don't know exactly where the line is, but I know where the extremes are. If you've worked in one place for 25 years, expect that half the companies are not going to want to talk to you. If you've had three jobs in the last four years, expect that 70% of the, the companies aren't going to want to talk to you. As the job market becomes tighter, um, those edges move further and further out. So people that a recruiter wouldn't have talked to two years ago suddenly becomes far more attractive when there are fewer and fewer candidates out there. My suggestion is always to tell the story. If you've jumped around a lot, but there was good reason. The company went out of business. There was a, a change in leadership. They brought in their own team. Most resume readers can understand that, and they won't hold it against you. If you just leave it to them to interpret this, then you're at their mercy. And most of us tend to think about the worst reason it could have happened. You know, if you haven't had a job in two years because you were taking care of a sick child or elderly parents, tell the reader. You wouldn't want to go to work for a company that couldn't understand that. But just leaving a two-year gap is a problem. And again, folks will fill in that blank with probably worse thoughts than you could ever imagine. So, you know, these are things that you really can't control for. If you've worked at some place for 22 years, it's a reality. If you've worked at three places in the last five years, it's a reality. What you need to do is try to mitigate, and I think the best way to mitigate is through telling a story that explains why it is uh, your background is as it is. Makes sense to me. Um, this person says, uh, and, and this is a kind of a falls into a little bit of the same category on the job hopping question that we had, but he says, I'm 48, um, and I had two mid-level positions in the last three years. I'm concerned about the job hopping piece of it. How would you suggest that I approach it? So two mid-level positions in the last three years. Yeah. Well, my uh, again, I'll just briefly repeat a part of what I just said, which is, um, there must have been a good reason for it. Share the reason for it. If the company went under, if the company had a uh, downsizing, if the company was purchased, um, if you were fired, um, you know, then it, it is what it is. You had no control over it. If you were contacted by a recruiter and were promised the career of a lifetime and you jumped sooner than you should have and it turned out not to be what you thought it was going to be, then I would share that information and talk about how you've learned a lesson and how job stability is 
is something you're looking to attain. If you had job stability, as many people did 15, 20 years ago, and more recently had this pattern of moving, I would refer to the fact that, you know, stability is in my blood. Look back at, you know, 2001 when I had spent 10 years in a company. The fact that I've jumped around recently is not who I am. It's not what I want to be known for. And, um, you know, if in the right opportunity, I will uh, commit to, to stay forever. So that's how I would do it. Great. Let's see here. Um, well, this person is, is commenting on something that's uh, it's more directed at their situation, so it's probably uh, better we address it separately. Uh, this person says, what should I tell my potential new employer about the reason uh, why I'm leaving without going into specific detail? Uh, I think what he's talking about here is because of his feelings about what was going on on the job and, and he, he has left because he had concerns about either ethics in the organization or something where he just, his personal value system said, sure. I, I need to leave. Yeah, I mean, one rule of thumb is you don't bad mouth right. um, where you've been. So even if the situation was untenable, you know, um, you try not to bad mouth your past employers. Um, it's something that recruiters and hiring managers look at very negatively. Um, and they look at it as a personality flaw on your part. If you can say something nice, don't say some, anything at all. That being said, I don't want you to take the hit for something of this type. And so in many cases, if there's a settlement of any type, you would be sworn to secrecy. You would be told that, okay, here's the settlement. Um, you were right. There was discrimination. You were right. Uh, you were harassed. Um, um, if you promise to not share the information, we'll give you a severance package and a great recommendation. And so one of the things you might say, assuming it's true, is that, you know, I'd love to go into detail about my last employer and why I'm on the job market right now, but I signed uh, an agreement which precludes me from doing so, and I hope you'll respect that. And most folks will respect it because they probably have the same thing going on with people that have left their company. And, I, and I'll just add one quick thing to that because I've had uh, instances where people have been in situations where, in particular, they were they were concerned about the ethical practices of, of where they were and they just decided they needed to get out of that situation. And that is that if, if those kinds of things that were going on, uh, everybody has a reputation, not just by individual, but also by company. And if what you saw there uh, was you know, bothering you that much, it probably wasn't the only time it happened. And my guess is that within at least that industry segment, people probably would have a perception um, that, you know, of what was going on there. So it may not come as a, a huge surprise to them that uh, that you decided to leave and uh, even yeah, without, and if they without did know this, that information. Dave, if they did know this about the company, they might applaud you for right. leaving. It, Exactly. Rather than sticking around. So yep. it could work to your advantage. Exactly. Um, this, this person says, I'm open to jobs outside of my current location, but because I'm often not familiar with the new area, I would like to get some time with my spouse to see the area before accepting the offer. I've had companies pressure me to accept positions before uh, being able to do that. How do I deal with a place that wants an answer quickly before we get a chance to see the area? Should I tell them that I can't accept uh, unless we get a uh, get a trip to uh, to get us, uh, I'm sorry, can't accept unless we get a trip there uh, within a week or so. This is part of the um, kind of the offer yeah, process it, here, right? It, yep. Now, why do companies want to get you to accept very quickly? Um, the reason is because this they see you as an ideal candidate. They don't want you staying on the market and potentially getting a better offer. 
they want to lock you up. And if you're not going to take the offer, they don't want to wait three months um, before moving on to another candidate. So all their reasons are rational. Um, something I, I mentioned before that I'll repeat. If a company doesn't understand that you need a little bit of time to think about the offer, but more explicitly, to learn more about the community and to make sure that your spouse, your family has bought in to this decision, then it's probably some leading indicator of work-life balance or sensitivity to the workforce that you're likely to experience in spades were you to go to work for this company. So I can't believe any company might say, no, I want an answer tomorrow, rather than saying, listen, I'll, I'll make plans to fly out there Monday morning with my spouse, look around the community, just to make sure that, you know, as a family we've bought in, you certainly want, wouldn't want me making a decision like this without having the full support of my spouse uh, because you know what kind of repercussions there might be. I'm really interested in this role. I'm not going to screw you around. Um, I'm inclined to accept the role. I just want to make sure I've crossed that last T, and it's an important T to cross because I never want to cross my spouse. and that I need to be able uh, to mitigate for by visiting the community. Um, I'd be happy to have dinner with you guys if you want to meet my spouse while I'm there. Um, but you need to give me um, at least one more week. Are you willing to do that? And if they said no, then they're jerks and you don't want to work for them. Yep, absolutely true. Uh, this person says, when a headhunter calls me, how can I be sure that they have a real job and aren't just fishing for resumes to fill their database or something like that? That's what an quest old... <laughs> what questions should I be asking the headhunter, <laughs> Mr. Headhunter? Oh, gosh. You know, <clears throat> if a headhunter is just making these random calls to fill up the database, it's the opposite of what we were just talking about. They don't have time to do that. They don't have the inclination to do that. Or they've hired some summer intern to do that. But a real, especially a retained search person, right. is not going to be doing that under any conditions. And in contingency kinds of things, geez, I, unless they know something is coming down the pike um, and they want to get out in front of it, um, it, it at, in, this, in 2015, it, it's unlikely that's going to happen. Now, should you be the exception to the rule and somebody calls you uh, and you're concerned about it, I'd say, tell me about the job. You know, what kind of an opportunity is it? Don't need to know who the company is, but is it a sales job or is it a custodial job? Does it require a lot of travel? Uh, where is it located? Um, is this a manufacturing company or a pizza parlor? You know, just give me some basic information about the firm, because if I'm not interested, I may know some folks who are. So what can you tell me about the firm? And again, if they say, I can't tell you anything, then I say, well, thank you for your time. I can't tell you anything either. Yeah. And I, we've had a fair amount of experience with stuff like this over the 27 years that we've been operating. And I will tell you that one of the, uh, first of all, the good news is that uh, when, when a, uh, a search firm, uh, be it contingency or otherwise, uh, gets here, we know who most of them are, for one thing. Secondly, we have always said to uh, any company that, that comes to us and wants to actually post a job, and as I mentioned earlier in the call, the number of jobs that you see posted are very, very much the tip of the iceberg, which is why your profile and making sure you've got a resume up there is so, is so critical. But being that as it may, uh, we have told them, look, uh, uh, if we don't happen to know you and you want to post something here, that's fine. But the minute we find out that, that you are trolling in the, in the kind of the context that this person says, whether it's to get resumes or whatever, um, uh, that is the last job you were ever going to post here. And I'm here to tell you that the members of this network uh, are action-oriented. Uh, they are going to react to this. 
and it won't take us long to figure out whether or not it's real or it isn't. Uh, and if it isn't, uh, you're going to have to take that take that stuff elsewhere. So um, it, it is it has not been an issue, uh, at least an issue for us here. So Dave, um, let me just piggyback on that for a second. Sure. Because Dave mentioned earlier that your research shows that about 70% of the jobs come through networking. Right. The next biggest cluster for me, at least, are jobs where people find you. Yeah. Um, they have a job. Dave just said as well that, um, you know, a lot of recruiters don't post jobs because they don't want to be inundated right. with hundreds of unqualified resumes. So True. rather than that, they'd rather go and do a search of profiles on our site, on other sites, resumes on our sites or other sites, and find people who are qualified for the role. This is part of your push strat a pull strategy. You need a push strategy and a pull. Your pull is to be found. And if your profile on Execunet, if your profile on LinkedIn doesn't have a picture, you're eight times less likely to be found. Yep. If you have typos and um, poor grammar in your uh, resume or profiles, and I need to tell you 60, 70% of the resumes I look at um, have typos in them. And this is a death knell. So you need to make sure that if you're found, first of all, you need to make sure you are found, which is about keyword optimization. And then if you are found, that what they find is going to be impressive to them. Because a lot of what I get to see and what my team gets to see is anything but impressive. Yeah, and I would uh, just let me put a quick plug in here for, for Don in this regard. I mean, he is he, he is definitely a subject matter expert uh, in, the, in this whole arena. He's done a number of, of uh, webinars for us where he goes into detail about a number of the things, particularly with regard to, to resumes, um, personal branding, uh, and, and that, uh, that, that whole realm of, of things where it comes to marketing yourself. And, and as a platinum member here, all of that is available to you as part of your membership. Um, and uh, you can use the search engine, as I alluded to earlier in the call. Just type in Don Weintraub. It will bring some of those things up, and, you, and they're available to you on demand, so you can watch them at your leisure. But it, it, is, it is good, good stuff. Um, and, it, and if you have insomnia, it's particularly <laughs> effective as well. <laughs> yes, there, there you go. <laughs> That's probably not a bad thing. Note to end on here, Don, because we <laughs> kind of have run out of time. But well, we uh, put people to sleep. Yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, anyway, is there anything you'd like to share with share with the group before we have to close up? Um, yeah, based on the comments uh, or the questions from today, um, it sounds like you know fo things are getting better overall in the marketplace. Some of the questions asked today were not asked even a couple of months ago, in terms of you know, getting these job offers and the like. I just want to reiterate one thing I said earlier, and that is um, a lot of the issues that I find, especially the older the candidate gets, um, is our assumptions based on the fact that, you know, I I'm never going to get another job again. Yeah. And um, when you believe that in your own mind, it is often a self-fulfilling prophecy. So stay positive. There is hope out there. Um, find companies that will appreciate your experience rather than discriminate for your age. And uh, it's likely to happen sooner rather than later in August of 2015, certainly when you compare it to August of 2012. So I wish you the best of luck, and I appreciate your spending time with Dave and me today. Great. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it as always. Thanks also to Tom Wesney for his help today in the in Operations Control Center, but most of all certainly to those of you on the call uh, for joining us. And uh, certainly would look forward to your joining us uh, on other uh, events down the road, whether it's six-figure call or one of the webinars uh, that are available. So with that, we wish everybody a uh, terrific weekend. Thanks, everyone.